welcome to another bite-sized talk from Museums Worcestershire. Today's talk is about HMS Rattlesnake and the journey she undertook in 1846, embarking on scientific survey work. With trading routes around the world opening up into further flung areas, there was a need to find safe shipping passages to these places. Australia's remarkable Great Barrier Reef was a nightmare for ships. Many had been shipwrecked trying to navigate their way through. HMS Rattlesnake set out with Captain Owen Stanley to continue the work of previous expeditions by producing detailed maps of the coast of New Guinea and to survey the Coral Sea. Every hazard was charted with accuracy in order for future vessels to navigate safe passage through the shoals. Stanley was a botanist and member of the Royal Geographical and Astronomical Societies. In December 1846, he set sail with the crew and his steward Robert Gale, naturalist John McGillivray and Thomas Henry Huxley, an assistant surgeon and naturalist. The ship they travelled on was HMS Rattlesnake, a naval 28-gun frigate which was considered obsolete at 24 years of age by the time it was chosen for the task of surveying. Older vessels were generally used for scientific research when they had reached the end of their career in the Navy. With a refit, it was thought that the ship would have at least another four or five years at sea before retiring. Its voyages of scientific work included expeditions to Australia in 1836, New Zealand in 1837, and Australia and New Guinea in 1846 to 1850. It's this last expedition that I'm going to talk about. Other ships had been sent to join the expedition, and the Rattlesnake was accompanied by HMS Bramble, a 10-gun cutter which was also refitted as a survey vessel. And after April 1847, under the command of Charles Yule, was used as a tender to HMS Rattlesnake. She undertook surveys and explored the southern part of New Guinea and the Louisiade Archipelago. The ASP, a steamer, had also joined the proceedings. So what did these survey voyages have to do with Worcester? All will be revealed later on in the talk. Their journey down to Australia was by the way of the island of Madeira off the coast of Portugal, travelling to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, then across the South Atlantic to Mauritius, on to Hobart before setting up base in Sydney. Their expedition took them to the waters of Port Curtis, Rockingham Bay, Port Mole, Cape York, Gould Island, Lizard Island, Morton Island in Queensland, Port Essington in the Northern Territory and Sydney. In 1847, the expedition visited Hobart, Tasmania and surveyed the coast of the Bass Strait, the southern coast of Papua New Guinea and the Louisiade Archipelago. I want to tell you about John McGillivray as he wrote a very detailed account. John McGillivray was born in Aberdeen. His father, William, was Chair of Natural History at Marischal College, Aberdeen. And John, who was training for the medical profession, decided to change tack and instead turn to natural history. He had sailed on other voyages before embarking upon HMS Rattlesnake and had already published several articles on the natural history of Scotland and Australia. He had sailed on board HMS Fly as a naturalist and already had experience of surveying parts of the coast of Australia. He returned home in 1846 in time to embark upon HMS Rattlesnake in the same year. McGillivray's account is a day-to-day -day description of the islands and areas they travelled to, the work they undertook, the specimens that were collected and the interactions they had with the indigenous peoples of those islands. The interactions were inconsistent in nature. McGillivray recorded the language of the people that he encountered, which enabled communication. However, cultural differences meant that sometimes the communication broke down. 
there were also times when they encountered various hostile communities and there were times when they were just as hostile in their interactions. One of the events that occurred was the ill-fated Kennedy expedition. Edmund Kennedy was a surveyor of the Colony Survey Department and had spent time in the interior surveying routes overland in Australia when he met Captain Stanley. With trade along the east coast between Sydney and Singapore increasing, it was decided by the governor at the time that Kennedy and Stanley could travel together towards Cape York, where Stanley could start the survey of the water routes of the Torres Straits and Kennedy would transverse a route through to Cape York overland. The Tamashanta, a ship of 27 tonnes, was employed to travel with the rattlesnake to transport Kennedy with his party and equipment. They arrived at Rockingham Bay on 20th of May. 1848. But setting out was difficult and the party had to try and get through mangrove swamps, mountains, rainforests and rivers, which meant they had to ditch some carts and supplies. They only travelled 40 miles in nine weeks as the going was so hard. The party was due to meet with more provisions from the Bramble at Princess Charlotte Bay, but this did not occur as the expedition was two months late. By mid-November, the expedition was tiring. Eight men were left at Weymouth Bay, with just Kennedy and four others continuing on. One of the party accidentally shot himself, and so two were left to look after him, while Kennedy and his Aboriginal tracker, Jackie Jackie, proceeded. As they were traversing the difficult terrain, they were followed by local indigenous people, where 20 miles away from Cape York, Kennedy was hit with spears several times and died in Jackie Jackie's arms. Jackie Jackie managed to get to a supply ship. A search party went to find the two men, tending to the shot individual, but only found discarded equipment and clothes. And out of the eight left at Weymouth Bay, only two survived. The rest had starved to death. You can see on this slide a memorial to Kennedy on the wall of St James Church in Sydney, which includes a depiction of Kennedy dying in the arms of Jackie Jackie. The name Jackie Jackie has since become a part of Australian and Australian Aboriginal slang, which for white people was a dismissive name, which denied the Aboriginal Australian their individuality by not calling them by their given name. And to the Aboriginals, Jackie Jackie meant a native that was subservient and went along with their own people's dispossession. One of the people on the voyage was Robert Gale. He was the captain's steward. He eventually left HMS Rattlesnake in Sydney towards the end of the expedition under somewhat of a dark cloud when his relationship with Captain Stanley broke down. In fact, Stanley wrote to his sister about dismissing him due to misconduct. Robert has been behaving so ill that I have been obliged to dismiss him and get another steward. Robert's insolence was greater than anything I have ever met since I have been at sea. Unfortunately, the details of that misconduct was not recorded. There were difficulties from the off with Stanley and Gale. Stanley feeling that Gale was acting above his station and Gale calling the captain childish on more than one occasion in his diaries. When Gale returned to England, he settled in West Malvern and became a prominent member of society. He became a church warden and was a constable and rate collector for the parish. He donated a great number of bird skins and shells from Australia and Papua New Guinea as well as a variety of spears, clubs, arrows, paddles, domestic articles, dresses, pottery and other curiosities. He had traded these with the indigenous people during the expedition. These came to Worcestershire's Natural History Society. His diaries are kept at the Royal Greenwich Archives. I will show you some of the objects from the collection further on in the talk. Towards the end of the expedition, there was general unrest amongst the scientists on board. Stanley would refuse to settle into ports, 
and was becoming agitated with his crew. On their way back to Sydney, after surveying a stretch of Papua New Guinea, Captain Stanley appeared to have a breakdown. His health declined rapidly, and he had a series of fits, the last of which occurred while he was convalescing at a house in Sydney. He passed at the age of 38, and was laid to rest in Sydney, with a few hundred people in attendance, amid processions, regimental bands, and three volleys shot over the grave. He was a well-known and respected captain. With the captain's demise, the expedition was all but over. HMS Rattlesnake returned with the crew to England. As promised, I will now go through some of the objects that have been identified as coming from Robert Gale. This one is easy. It has his name on the label. The label also points out that it was from Port Essington. By most accounts, they did not have a good time of it at Port Essington. They complained a lot about the heat. In McGillivray's account, Robert's diaries and other documents, some of the objects that were collected are so detailed, not only in description, but also in drawings, that when looking at the collection, it's pos possible to identify it, which is very handy when a lot of the objects have become adrift from their original labels and information. Here we have in the collection a plant fibre garment, a comb and an ads. It is not entirely certain whether all of these objects came from the Rattlesnake expedition, so further work is needed to try and identify that. But these are some of the finest examples collected. The top left image is of a knife made with an obsidian blade and highly decorative handle from Papua New Guinea. Then below that is a coiled map from South Australia, which was used not just for sitting on, but also for transporting infants on mother's back. And the last object here is a smoking pipe. This last object is currently on display in Gallery 2 and is a rounded bowl typical of the Louisiade Islands. It has with it its original label. Further work and research is currently being undertaken in order to produce an upcoming exhibition, which will not only exhibit these objects, but many more. And further stories of HMS Rattlesnake and the events that surrounded their expedition. We hope that when our doors finally open, that you will come and visit us. Thank you very much for watching.